I'd like to thank the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma for inviting me to speak today at the session on kickstarting your research career. I'm happy today to be discussing what you need from a program to be successful and how you can negotiate it. I do have some federal grant funding and I do receive some consulting um, honorarium for the Johnson & Johnson Company. Uh, none of these two entities have any role in what I'm talking about today. When you are contemplating what resources you need to succeed, first you must think about how you define your research and then how you envision your research career unfolding. And only after that uh, level of introspection can you um, identify what resources you need to succeed. So let's start with defining your research. What kind of research do you want to pursue? There's going to be something that you are naturally inclined to, some, some area, some methodology that you enjoy um, as a uh, surgeon scientist. And this may be health services research, which includes methods such as epidemiology, economic analyses, survey research, geographic information systems, quality uh, of life research, qualitative methods, uh, community-based participatory research, uh, as well as social network analysis. It may be clinical translational research where you, you know, truly want to work um, in the uh, realm of uh, bringing uh, benchside discoveries to the bedside or, you know, in comparing in a head-to-head -head randomized fashion um, the most, you know, cutting-edge uh, technology or interventions uh, for our patients. And then finally, of course, the um, basic science discoveries that occur in the in vitro or in vitro settings in the laboratory. Um, all of these can be areas that you wish to pursue, but in order to succeed, I think it is important for you to find um, the uh, methodology that most inspires you um, to further your uh, research career as a trauma surgeon. Uh, importantly, all three types of science that I described are real science. I think, you know, as a culture amongst us surgeons, it's very important for us to acknowledge this and for those of us in uh, separate um, uh, types of uh, research domains to um, avoid using divisive language or comparisons that um, state that one science is harder than the other or one science is better than the other or um, one science is not real science. They are all real science. They all share a methodologic rigor. However, they use different tools um, in uh, executing those methods. Importantly, none of these methods, none of these um, uh, types of research are hobbies that are done on nights and weekends. You absolutely, to succeed in your research career, will be doing work on nights and weekends. However, for none of these um, types of um, uh, research domains should we accept that as the standard, uh, in particular for those of us who are on funded research career pathways. Because all three, in order to have a successful research portfolio, require time, specific skills, and of course a team to support you as you are the PI. Next, you have to think about how you envision your research career. If you think about it, um, there are many people who still aspire to be sort of the classic triple threat where they evenly balance patient care, education, and research. However, with continuous advances in patient care technology um, and uh, increasing requirements for master educators, as well as decreasing funding lines, it does become difficult to equally succeed um, uh, at all of these domains. And most people in the modern era of surgical careers tend to focus on one slightly more than the other. And then within that, there's a sort of um, uh, a, a ratio th that seems to fit uh, or feels comfortable uh, for you um, as the researcher. And so is it a little bit of research on the side, but really your focus is patient care and education? Or is it really a, you know, 50% uh, or more of your career will be, you know, research related? And then, of course, you will remain engaged in patient care and in the course of that patient care be a good, committed educator, but certainly that is not your focus. Um, and the reason to be, you know, mindful of where you see these ratios fitting is that, you know, a typical research career involves a lot of work that is generally not appreciated by people who don't do research. And so there is the time that needs to be dedicated to critical thinking, even if you aren't sort of visibly doing anything, so that you can develop, you know, research design. There's the effort that goes into regulatory compliance. All of this has to happen before you, we can consider conducting the research. Um, after you've conducted the research, there's the time and effort that goes into uh, disseminating it through the proper channels and then taking that evidence and implementing change, measuring benchmarks of your research success, measuring the effects 
again, in a research-oriented fashion of the change that you implemented. And for all of this to occur on a continuous basis, there needs to be grant funding because the um, internal revenues at the department level cannot sustain a lifelong research career at a policy bending level or at a sort of novel, um, you know, molecule, novel uh, bedside uh, um, discovery level without extramural um, funding. And the important part of this so that we can retain a culture that respects all of these kinds of science is being willing to give and receive feedback. Reciprocal feedback is key to the life cycle of a surgeon scientist. So once you've thought about, you know, um, what kind of a scientist you are and what kind of a, a research career that you want to cultivate, you can then hone in on the resources that you need. Um, you know, amongst these resources are time, uh, what you need or who you need on your research team, um, the mentors who will help you cultivate your research career early on, and whether or not you need any skills or, or degrees. So um, let's look at this in a slightly reverse order. In terms of additional training, um, what is your existing skill set? Did you already have training in your residency that you know um, came with or without a degree, but that makes you confident that whatever skills you're choosing, be it in the laboratory or um, in um, you know a health services research center are where they need to be. Um, do you simply need a little bit additional uh, training or do you need a lot of additional training? Is it not methodologic training but grantsmanship training? Um, so think about that um, so that you can um, create a learning plan that will allow you to develop the skills that you are missing in order to conduct your search. Um, and then, you know, it's important to explore what are the options necessary to gain existing skills. There are short training courses um, as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, summer long courses. Uh, in addition, there are, you know, two-year degree programs. Um, uh, there are options to audit courses depending on where you are working. So it becomes a little bit of researching and inquiry on your part to identify after you think about your skill set and what you need how you can obtain that. Um, and of course, one way you could um, get a better understanding of that is by asking a mentor. If we think about mentorship, it is a one-on-one -on -one mutual committed relationship between a junior and senior person that is designed to promote personal and professional development beyond any particular curricular or institutional goals. Um, really, the goal is about you and cultivating you as a researcher. And a good mentor will facilitate that um, uh, However, it's a two-way street and you need to be a good mentee. You need to engage, you need to follow up, um, and you need to be present, in particular since most senior mentors who are really good at this, as committed as they are, they will have several mentees. And if you become the mentee who never shows up, then it will be difficult to reap the benefits of a strong mentor-mentee relationship. Um, it has been proven that having a uh, good mentor relationship results in earlier promotion in academic medicine, more publications, for um, uh, clinician scientists, higher career satisfaction, as well as increased retention of women and minorities. Uh, within this framework of what the potential um, benefits of mentorship will be, and my favorite uh, definition of mentorship, it's important to remember that um, you may not always have a single mentor. In fact, typically speaking, you will have a mentor for different things, uh, including your research career. While some people have a single research mentor, most people will have sort of a global research mentor. And then they may choose to have mentors in specific methodologic areas as the needs arise, or maybe even a thought leader. For example, you might be a health services researcher, but you're studying bariatric surgery. You might uh, find mentorship in a clinical bariatric surgeon who's not a health services researcher, who can't really mentor you on the science, but as you are thinking about ideas and want to vet their relevance in a real world situation, that mentor who's a clinical bariatric surgeon with you know decades of experience really will be helpful to you. Um, so in addition to um, these concepts, we will need a research team because, you know, within the career um, of a surgeon scientist, it really is not possible to do it all yourself. And success is um, bred by bringing together the, you know, human capital that can really um, result in your success. And so depending on, you know, what your type of science is, you may need a project coordinator or a lab tech. 
This person provides the high-level research admin support, the regulatory compliance support, provides um, uh, you know submissions and uh, literature uh, reviews, um, and does outlines and copy editing. They'll run experiments, um, uh, things like that. And then you may need a data analyst or a postdoc who will um, uh, manage your databases or conduct your experiments, plan and write statistical um, or experimental plans, perform analyses or experiments, and then um, assist in interpreting and visualizing results, uh, perhaps even um, doing um, some of the uh, write-ups. Um, it is important to identify the human capital that you need. Understand that sometimes the most expensive um, investments early in a faculty member's research career are hiring the um, uh, research support team. And then possibly, most importantly, you need time to think and do research. This honestly feels like it's the Achilles heel or the albatross around uh, the neck of a researcher or the elephant in the room of departments that truly, truly want to support their um, uh, young uh, research faculty. Um, you will be called upon to be a mentor of the trainees and students. You will be called upon to give lectures in that educational wheelhouse. You will be called on to serve on hospital committees and to be compliant with your billing and coding in a um, typical fashion. All of these things occur outside of your clinical role, and your clinical role is extraordinarily time consuming. And as a result of that, and as a result of the fact that we will always, as we should, um, prioritize patient care when that care is needed, um, our presentations, our manuscripts, our grants, they typically fall um, uh, to the uh, back burner. Um, within all of this, outside of patient care, there's always stuff that is urgent to the system or urgent to other people that is quite frankly not important to your research career, but it has to be done. And again, these can be distractions, and so it's important to have carved out time where you um, can be free of those distractions and focus on the work of research and the thinking that a researcher must do. So the next step, once you've thought about all of these things and decided what you need, is to negotiate. If you look at the definition, um, negotiation is a method by which people settle differences. It's a process by which compromise or agreement is reached while avoiding argument and dispute. But just by using the word difference, it, 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 it's obvious that you know negotiating protected time in academic research can be adversarial because there will be differences. And why are there differences? Well, there are a number of them. First, the currency of our work is in our um, uh, RVUs, uh, and there's always going to be pressure to um, uh, make the most of our clinical revenue. Second, our learners are always present. We cannot neglect them, right? They are showing up as medical students, as residents, so that they can learn from us how to be outstanding clinical surgeons. And we are, at the end of the day, still clinical surgeons. And so there is the, you know, the, the demand for teaching and our desire to be quality teachers. And again, that ends up being um, a challenge in terms of the um, uh, other part of the academic mission, namely research. Um, finally, there's this concept of, you know, people who are not scientists don't understand. Often, you are in the position of having to negotiate with someone to give you the time that you need who doesn't actually understand what research is all about, who may have a sort of pejorative attitude towards the kind of science that you are seeking expertise in. Um, specifically to us as trauma surgeons, acute care surgeons, defining 1.0 FTE in our specialty is extraordinarily complicated. And so if you don't have a floor or a ceiling, depending on how you look at it, that defines 1.0 FTE, how do you negotiate what 0.75 looks like or what 0.50 looks like so that you can spend the um, other part of your time conducting research? Well, in order to get there, given that there will be some sort of adversarial feeling around this, I highly recommend reading this book, Getting to Yes, um, uh, which is uh, about negotiating agreement without giving in. And it describes, you know, the main facets that you need um, to uh, get to yes for, um, you know, what you've uh, decided you need to succeed. You know, first is knowing your adversary. Again, knowing their viewpoint, knowing their perspective, and understanding what they are getting out of it. Two, um, sell your research. Um, you're the um, PI, um, you have a unique skill set, you will be contributing to the department through the work that you're doing, and quite possibly your adversary, who might be your division chief or your chair or your dean, wants to bring in those research dollars, wants to bring in the national profile of having um, a successful researcher. 
You have to establish your roles clearly while exemplifying that there are mutual benefits in achieving those goals that are, on the one hand, individual to you, but on the other hand, meaningful um, on a larger level to the institution or entity, be that your division, your department, or the university. Um, and then you absolutely need to know um, uh, precisely what you are asking for because otherwise they won't be able to give it to you in particular um, with time. Understanding that time um, in this uh, area actually means money. So who should you negotiate with? Should it be your division chief, your chair, the dean? Well, quite frankly, it depends on who has the resources to support your needs. Importantly, if you are jumping rank, make sure that your other leaders know and are supportive. Um, that leader may be your mentor, it may be your division chief if you're going directly to the chair, it may be the chair if you're going directly to the dean, it'll often be more than one person. Um, and ask them for the favor of negotiating with them uh, before you go to the ultimate person who will be able to, you know, um, air quotes, write a check um, to support your uh, protected time. Um, ultimately, your key target for negotiation has to be in a position to provide the time and resources and to see its value to the organization. Um, and to get there, you need to clearly demonstrate that your body of research, um, that your research is developing a body of work for which you will be known as a leading surgeon scientist and for which extramural funding is a goal. People want to know that they're investing in someone who is going to provide them a uh, return on investment. And so it is important to make this absolutely clear as you are trying to get to yes. So what should you negotiate for? Again, a clear delineated list. Um, the commitment of mentors. Now, you can't have them sign a contract, or at least I've never seen one, but there needs to be at least a you know handshake like, yes, I am committed to supporting your research career in the coming years. I will, you know, make an effort to be present, as we've discussed, for our monthly mentorship meetings, our weekly mentorship meetings, our quarterly mentorship meetings, and of course, available by phone, text, or by ad hoc meeting request in between as needed. Um, you should negotiate for the um, uh, human capital investments you need for your research team. You know, typically it should be a minimum of, 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 of two portions or two whole people that you're asking for. One to help with the nuts and bolts of your research and another person to help with the higher level stuff. So um, that might be a postdoc and a data analyst depending on your science or a clinical research nurse for the um, uh, research execution. And it might be a program manager, project coordinator, lab manager for the kind of day-to-day -day grind of um, research. Um, you should negotiate space. In particular, if you're going to have a wet lab, but there also needs to be space for dry lab space. You hire people, they're going to be working with you. Where are they going to be sitting? Um, uh, who are they going to be collaborating with on a day-to-day -day basis while you're operating, but they're doing you know, um, health outcomes research? But space is at a premium at all academic medical centers, and it is crucially important that you have a blueprint of the space that you're going to get with your name on it um, so that that becomes a uh, contractual um, uh, uh, obligation. And then finally, while you are aiming for funded research, you will need startup funds to support you, know, you getting there or bridge funds if you're transitioning from one kind of research career to another. Now this money could be for databases, research support, um, using ad hoc research services that might be available through research cores like an mRNA core or a um, you know, graphic design core, uh, salary support for any research assistants, you know, summer students that want to rotate through. Um, these could be small grant funds um, as well as travel, right? So as you start succeeding, but before you have large sums of grant funding, you need to develop your reputation. You need to go around the country and, and, and present and, and be at the podium, and uh, all of this needs to be funded. And at most institutions, the CME money runs out well before you get to actually travel. And so here is that like most uh, difficult part, which is this uh, protected time um, and uh, how much time you really need. Ultimately, I will tell you that percentages are smoke and mirrors, um, again, largely because we really haven't done a great job in our specialty defining 1.0. Um, with this in mind, I think it is important to at least specify in days, weeks, or months what you need and ensure that the goals you have set for yourself are realizable within that time frame. Um, I would also state clearly 
you know, because you're a team player, when you are asking for money to support your time, that you're also going to look for other resources to cover your salary. This might come through the Clinical Translational Science Center at your institution if you have one. It may come from society grants or it may come from early NIH or equivalent funding. So there are, you know, the, the Macy Foundation grants, the um, GEMSTAR uh, award. There's the Greenwall Foundation for Early Investigator Funding. There are many options, uh, not just the NIH K-series, um, that can be beneficial and provide the kind of salary coverage that can at least take the sting out of protecting a surgeon's time for research. It's also critically important to lay out your goals and your um, timeline. You have to have a clear set of deliberals uh, that you can describe to the person with whom you're negotiating. And you need to clearly state your annual goals. You know, I'm going to write four papers a year in a journal that has an impact factor greater than two. I'm going to do three national podium presentations a year, or at least strive for that. Um, and then what will your benchmark achievements be? Will that be a K award by year three? Will that be an R01 by year five or seven? Will that be being promoted from assistant to associate by year seven? Be clear so that the person you're negotiating with can see that your research career is playing into your larger career as um, an academic surgeon. Um, you have to ask for and justify any other resources. Honestly, write it out like a budget justification. I need X, and this is how um, I will be using X to execute my research and attain the goals I have described to you. The person that you are negotiating with will very much appreciate that you brought forth a document that clearly delineates what you need, how much it costs, and um, describes in enough detail for them to understand um, without being overly detailed what the point is of that specific ask for your research career. You need to set goals that stand out above others' goals so that you will be the chosen one to get the extra time or the extra money that is available to um, get your research career kick-started. But you need to be realistic and then you need to own the time and resources it will take to achieve them. Nothing hurts future researchers more um, and like-minded colleagues more than having an ask, getting what you ask for, and then not executing on it. You know, not taking advantage of the gift that someone gave you for your career um, development. You also need to clearly state how your department will benefit. You will increase the de departmental research output through these publications and presentations. You will bring in grant funding. I think it's important for you to have looked up and know your department's Blue Ridge ranking, know how many funded researchers are, and see how you will be able to enhance that with your successes. And then you need to talk about how you can be a resident mentor. Where do they do research now? Be aware of that um, uh, information so that you can talk about how you will complement that. Um, and any other sort of, you know, compelling options that you might provide, not just to the resident mentorship, but across the department and maybe even the medical school as a surgeon scientist doing novel work. Through all of this, through all of this negotiation, please present your authentic self as a surgeon and as a scientist. Share your passion. Show the person you're negotiating with why this idea and this set of skills light your heart on fire. Um, state your case. Acknowledge that you realize this is investment and ensure the person that if they make the investment, you will garner a return on their investment. And finally, as I stated before, do the work. Take the time that you're given um, through some salary support to think. Meet with other like-minded scientists, including PhDs around campus that you haven't even met yet. Seek them out. Meet regularly. Exchange ideas with one another. Study. Become a methodologic expert. Buff up on methods that you, you know, were trained in in residency, but you need extra training in. Or read every manuscript that's written on propensity scores, for example, so that you can get better at it. And then write. Write, write, write. You know, one of the best tips that I got from a mentor was to spend an hour a day writing something that's scholarly. Right? Not a progress note. But whether it's a paragraph of a grant, even if you don't intend on submitting that grant anytime soon, or a paragraph of a paper, or a paragraph of an abstract that you might submit for the next big deadline, spend at least an hour of day training your mind to think and write like a scholar. And finally, fiercely protect your protected time. Your research is urgent and important even when there is not a deadline. I think we get very caught up on a deadline, and without a deadline, it becomes difficult for us to get stuff done. Um, but your time for a promotion, the time for your K award to end, or the time for your sort of like three years of time to get your K award will end because none of it had a hard deadline. And then before you know it, 
you've become a disappointment to yourself and to the people that invested in you. So make it an effort to be in the top left-hand box of the Covey Time Management Matrix for your research. If you have a research day granted to you or a research week granted to you, do not use it as a cheat day. Use it to work on your research. Um, as I stated, set, a time, set aside blocks of time to write um, at a minimum an hour a day, but at least once a week. Give yourself four hours where you won't have meetings, you won't have interruptions, and you can write. Um, uh, sometimes this might be at night, um, sometimes it might be on uh, weekends, but find an uninterrupted time to get your thoughts down and conceptualize the research that you're doing. And this is applicable for basic science ideas, translational ideas, as well as health services research ideas. Uh, limit meetings during your protected time that are not specifically research related. Um, and of course, use the time for necessary training and education in uh, methods. You need to view your protected time as your life vest, where your mentors are your captains, your research team members are your first mates, and your division colleagues are the ones who are sending you care packages while you are out to sea. You need to especially let go of some of the sort of patient care stuff that I know weighs heavily in all of our minds and have trust in your colleagues who aren't on the funded research career pathway um, uh, in order to be able to focus on um, the work of uh, being a funded researcher. Um, if you pursue your passion, um, then this is totally worth it. The effort, however, is not worth it if you are not following the passion. If you are doing this because someone told you to do it, but not because it lights your heart on fire, if you are doing this because you never paused and stopped to think that you really don't want an academic career, all of this is just not worth it. Um, but if it is going to be worth it, negotiate effectively to get to your version of yes. I would like to thank all of you for the time of um, uh, listening to me, and I would be happy to uh, take any questions uh, via email should they arise. Thank you.